Wait, so this is your podcast, Eddie? I don't know. This is the people's podcast. We're socialists. People's it's podcast. owned by the the workers. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brock is gonna get rock. He's gonna get fucking He's gonna get uh, blacklisted after this gets published. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. So I'm Eddie. I'm, I'm Rock. Oh, <laughs> and we're all stupid, lazy college socialists who aren't voting for Joe Biden. And we're no. gonna talk about why. Yes. Who wants to go first? Um, okay, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, go, uh, go. On our wrestling team, we got eight people who are in the National Guard, and we're told that they just had to join that. They wouldn't get deployed. And now there's, what, at least three of them getting deployed? At least. least. Not more. Yeah, one's so, already there in Afghanistan. Yeah, one's already there. So, I mean, when it comes to the issues that I really care about, all the unnecessary war we're in, funding a genocide in Yemen, everything in the Middle East, everything from the private prison system to healthcare, just none of my interests are even being remotely talked about through Joe Biden. So, it's, I don't see any point. Yeah, at least for me as a, as a fellow socialist, Bernie was that middle point. Like Democrats love talking about like uh, making concessions and and uh, compromising and all this shit, but Bernie's campaign was the epitome of a compromise. It was like as middle point as you can get. So um, you know we're not going to compromise a- anymore. Um, the situation is not um, one in which we can afford to compromise, just given the urgency of of the situation with climate change. And especially like right now, what we're seeing with the virus, which is something that's going to become much more frequent. Um, We need a national health service. Um, The compromise to that was the single payer health care that Bernie was proposing. And like that, um, amongst most of the policies that Bernie was was promoting, they're demonstrating to be um, completely essential now. And the ones that are not demonstrating to be essential, they're demonstrating that they were a midpoint towards something that would be essential, like single payer healthcare. Um, it would have been a lot better if it was like, like the advocacy for just the national health system. The countries that we've seen succeed in treating the, the pandemic have been those that have had a nationalized health system um, and who have been prepared from before uh, to deal with stuff like this because, again, their motives for running a government is to is to, you know, represent the interests of other people and not make money. Mm-hmm. And what Democrats usually fail to understand is the, you know, what led us to Trump. So they're all about vote for the lesser of two evils. But we had eight years of Obama-Biden policy. And after that eight years, people were ready to vote for Trump because they were so sick of the status quo and so sick of having a government that doesn't represent people they were ready to gamble on an orange billionaire reality tv show host rather than another four years of liberalism and hillary clinton so they act as if another four years of trump will be devastating whereas another four years of biden will be whatever but all you do by electing biden is put that mask over that mask back over everything that this country is doing that mask that trump rips off you know they asked trump like hey, why are we funding the Saudi Arabian genocide of Yemen? He's like, well, there's a lot of American companies making a lot of money off that. It's like, well, Obama and Biden would have been much better about hiding that, but Trump kind of rips the mask off and lets us see the ugly machine underneath. And unless you do something substantial to change that ugly machine, you're going to keep getting uh, fascist-type leaders like Trump. Or like when Bolton was talking about how the interest in Venezuela is because they have oil. It's mm-hmm. like, you're not supposed to say that, but the fact <laughs> that you are is better. Right. If you're so shitty is good because it's helping people like notice how shitty you are and the whole system overall. Exactly. Yeah, I think that um, a big part of 
why um, after the realization that Trump, that we ended up in Trump, why people are still looking for the same um, approaches as they were before, which is the middle point and the thing that essentially led us to Trump is because the, the media has done a really good job in pushing the narratives that all the problems started with Trump and they have boogie man him to a point where people are kind of psychotic. They're just like, we have to get him out. We have to get him out. It doesn't matter how, but we have to get him out. And it's like, do you realize that the person you're trying to elect has fucking molested women and, and, and has rape allegations? Like, how absurd is that? Like we've we've gotten to a level of absurdity that it's it's just insane because even Joe Biden like we're not talking about like Barack Obama in 2008 that although everyone knew he was lying because he was getting money from from the big banks and 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 big interests in Wall Street so everyone knew his policies weren't ever going to materialize at least it was like a nice image like the Democrats have always been the mask with the ship behind it right um, while the Republicans are. Just the shit with no mask but what we're seeing now is a democratic party that doesn't even take care of that mask that made him at least uh in in the in in the realm of like the imaginary or the illusion at least a little better um they're literally nominating a fucking rapist who can't make a coherent sentence so uh i guess that's a good sign for us as socialists uh, which means that this party that has taken for the like at least historically um the support of the working class is falling apart so we just we have to be there to to um to make sure that when it falls it falls completely and and either take it over or create our own party with the working class energy that was behind the dems um yeah i totally agree and that's why i'm voting third party because in 2016, most of the Bernie people came out and voted for Hillary. I didn't myself, but most of them did statistically. And what do we get? Four years later, they did the same old BS and screwed the only working class candidate, had everyone drop out and endorse Biden before Super Tuesday. Obviously, MSNBC and CNN are just giant propaganda machines for Biden. So if we, if we show up and we vote for Biden in the general election, what does that signal to the Democratic Party? You know, it tells them, all right. We can screw over the youth vote. We can screw over the working class vote. We can spit in the eye of the progressive base and they'll still come vote for us on election day. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do that just so we can have a president who doesn't tweet mean things. I mean, even the most heinous things Trump's done, like the rape allegations and the um, people in cages at the border, both of those things were happening under Obama, Biden. Um, I mean, Obama, Biden's also a rapist, but then there's also an interview with him where Jorge Ramos is asking him why there are kids in cages at the border when he was in power and Biden has no answer for him. He's like, oh, no, no, it really wasn't. And then there are pictures of kids in cages under the Obama administration. And in 2014 or 15, they tear gassed migrants at the border. They used tear gas on refugees who were trying to get over here. And it's like, how is this dude any different? But And... Most independents and most people who weren't that into politics who have gotten on board with Bernie can see right through that, but they're mostly independents around our age. Um, they, they don't understand why anyone's voting for Biden, but they also get all their information from the internet. They never watch MSNBC or CNN. If you turn on those networks for like five seconds, you can see why Biden has enough support to like win him the general. It's literally nonstop propaganda. I think they just did a study and the coverage of Bernie, they decided it was three times more negative quantitatively when you actually measure it out. Like they had three times the negative coverage on Bernie as Biden, but they've got people tricked, like you said, into thinking Trump's this terrible boogeyman. Bernie's this crazy socialist who will lose the general election because he's so crazy. And Biden's our only choice to stop this boogeyman from getting another four years, which they say will destroy our democracy. It's like, you people are ridiculous. Of course, if you have followed American politics for a while, you know that we haven't had a democracy forever. 93% of our elections are decided by who raises the most money. Anyone who's been involved in the Democratic Party over the last eight years knows we don't have a democracy. They just pick whoever they want. And... 
But MSNBC and CNN are so good at creating this narrative because they pump it out 24-7. And you p boomers, you know, flip on their TV and they're like, all right, time to get educated. I'm going to learn something about politics. And they don't realize they're being fed a nonsense narrative by the ruling class who owns these institutions. And uh, the effect of those propaganda machines is underrated, I think. Um, and we're going to need our own working class news outlets to overcome that, to get people the truth. Um, so, yeah. And that's the beauty of the internet. Right? We've, we've been able to expand so much in terms of just quantitatively with our cause because of this new arena, which we can start um, splurging our ideas. And Marx has a good quote in the German ideology, which says that, um, I'm paraphrasing, but it says that uh, revolutionary ideas are preceded by a revolutionary class. So the fact that we have these discussions, that we have things like Memes TV or Redfish or Telesaur and all these other like left-wing um, uh, channels and means to get educated uh, demonstrates that there is a revolutionary class, at least they're present. And I, I really appreciate the phenomena that's happening right now within the Democratic Party because it's, it's just it's making so obvious the things that we would say before. Um, so the fact that like socialists have been saying this whole time, well, the two parties are just really one party. Um, I forgot, I might've been, it was one of the African leaders, um, socialist leaders who said that America is, is still like a one party system, except with the natural extravagance of Americans, which they make a thing that's supposed to be one, two, like, we it's it's just one party and we've been saying it the whole time but um what was making it hard for people to see was the fact that the democrats at least would put on that nice mask um and 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 policy wise they would do the same thing but um as the republicans but now the removal of that mask just really slaps you in the face the fact that they don't even care to win they just want to continue portraying the idea that there's this uh, sense of democracy because it's the choice between two different parties, which are essentially the same thing. They have kidnapped the concept of what democracy is. And um, they have people all over this country thinking that they're living in a free democratic country just because every two years they go to a ballot box and vote for their master when they spend 10 fucking hours a day uh, working in, in a tyrannical workplace where, where they have no say over their work um, over how they do it, over what the result of the work uh, goes to, like, they have no say. And, and day by day, there's, um, there's less and less unionship, union membership and more propaganda against unions. And um, it's just one big paradox of the thing that is dominating the concepts of freedom and democracy doing the complete antithesis of what those concepts actually represent. Mm -hmm. and even like we said bernie is the half measure because even if we get bernie elected and somehow we get every single one of his policies pushed through like you said the corporations still have a hold over what you do 40 to 50 hours a week um you know we still have no control over our workplace it's a step in the right direction but i heard parenti talking about that with bernie he's like Bernie's talking about the corporations and the billionaires pitching in a couple cents to pay for healthcare and school and all these things. And he's like, that's not what it's about. It's about stopping the complete corporate control over our lives, which Bernie isn't even really offering as part of his platform. He's offering minor reforms. So 60,000 people don't die every year. And we don't have the student debt crisis where our young people have $1.4 trillion in debt as they're trying to enter the workforce. Um, but he's still not even offering what we want, where we want, you know, proletarian control of uh, the economy and of the political system, um, which is like, that's what we want. And Bernie's a step in that direction. And then liberal Democrats expect us to vote for Joe Biden. Like, he is not a step in that direction in any way, shape or form. He is a corporate puppet. He is nothing but a tool. The dude probably has no original thoughts in his head. He probably has no thoughts in his head anymore at all. It's turning to mush. He's literally <laughs> propped up. It wouldn't surprise me if it was like Weekend at Bernie's where they had like act 
Biden's actually dead and they have like strings attached to him and they're just operating him like, oh, I don't know, Jack, do uh, you want to do a push-up contest? But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you got to say, Brock? Um, what do y'all think about the people who are saying that uh, we need Biden just for uh, like other parts, like we need to uh, um, flip the Supreme Court, um, do stuff like that. Do you think that's really making a difference? No. No, because even, even Obama had the chance to like solidify the Supreme Court and he didn't. Um, so, I mean, that... I, again, like all these institutions just serve capital. So whether one one of the representatives is more conservative than the other, it's like I don't give a shit. Like you know, it's it's a lot. And and again, like a lot of these measures, which they could flip on like social issues, these are things that can actually be flipped back through like social movements. Right, like like gay rights. There, there's been social movements, and and the capitalist class concedes, and you know lets you have gay marriage because it doesn't threaten their interest in capital. So like these losses that we might have with a uh, conservative in the with a conservative uh, unbalance in the Supreme Court are not substantial like losses. They're losses in a small sector of that individualist liberal. Um, sector of our society but even even though like those rights are deserved um they're rights that you can fight for and get a lot easier than you can uh uh you know uh, uh union rights so i don't know I, uh, I i i completely disagree that we should vote for biden just because we're going to get a more liberal supreme court justice and i just saw the supreme court just voted like four to one to allow like cops to further uh or to search people with less uh with less due cause i didn't read the full article but like like carlos is saying your choice at the supreme court level is basically the same as your choice at the presidential level you can have like liberal bourgeois class person like ruth bader ginsburg or you can have like crazy bourgeois right winger like Kavanaugh, but ultimately they're gonna do basically the same stuff. Except the yeah, Republicans yeah. obviously have the goal of overturning Roe v. Wade, which I don't know if they'll ever get, but that would be the only reason. Um yeah, I don't know. I think it's uh, such it's, a it's, sign of how disillusioned we are to like we're in such a weird spot that like these guys who aren't representing any sort of change, anything that we remotely near what we want, that's still considered what a lot of people are shooting for, you know, cause we're so, we're so far right. And Trump's made it so much worse that like we're focused so much on Trump and not the system that all these democratic candidates who were basically the same as Republicans, you know, we, we see them as it's so, or the, the Supreme Court people, I should say, we see it as making such a difference when in reality, what difference is that going to make in anyone's life? Right. Yeah. It's, it's the role of, uh, of propaganda and, and ideology. And the, the beauty of it is that, like, the official, like, philosophy of, of the stage of capitalism that we're in, neoliberalism, is, is postmodernism. And it's the complete denial of every any sort of grand narrative and the idea that we live in a post ideological society. But the reality is that we are much more controlled by ideology than we've ever been in, in any stage of our lives. Like people love referencing like repression under uh, uncle Joe behind Brock. Um, but the thing is that, yeah, okay. There were gulags, but you can find a sort of freedom within the sort of what you want to call quote-unquote oppression or whatever. What we have now is the opposite, where we have the idea of unlimited freedom, but in the level of reality, what we have is the most ultimate form of repression. Because everything that's fed to us that we think of as accessing freely is really something that's dominated by a system, which in every way, shape, and form is set out to make us think uh in a way that is against our own self-interest like we we literally have at our at, at 
the fucking reach of our hands, a tool that can access everything. And we think we're free because of that, but we're constantly being watched. And, and like, we have, we have, we're in a place where we, there's the potentiality of us being watched at all times. So we, we think we're free. We're really unfree. But what we're missing, like, like Shishak says, I think correctly is the language to speak about our unfreedom. Um, and that's what I think a lot of these people who are supporting Joe Biden and just constantly listening to the MSNBC and the CNN narrative have, which is that they, they feel materially that they're fucked. They, they realize what we realize at least in, in the level of ideas, which is that, you know, the system gave us Trump. Trump is just a symptom of the system. The system is what got them to the material, harsh material conditions that they're in. They realize it physically. Um, they realize that working now is not the same as it was when their parents were working. Um, but ideologically, they are invested completely in their own, um, against their own interests. I think Terry Eagleton, who's a, a Irish Marxist philosopher and literary critic, he defines ideology in a way that I really like, which is it's just a study of how people go against their own, um, against their own interests. And that's what we're seeing, like, literally every day in the U.S., just people completely devoted and, and identifying with, with their master. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like, I wanted to talk about that concept of freedom a little more, because that's what Hayek and a lot of the um, Pro capitalists like liberal philosophers talk about was maximizing individual freedom and liberty. But what you have under a capitalist system that's been around for as long as ours has and has evolved to the point of ours is like basically zero freedom for the proletariat and then ultimate freedom for the capitalists. So the only people who have freedom are those who own wealth. Uh, everyone else has to go to work 40 hours a week if you want to survive, plus come home and take care of your kids and your home and then try and feed yourself and try and exercise. And then you're supposed to find time in there to learn and self-educate. You know, it's almost impossible. And then on top of that, you have 70% of workers who live paycheck to paycheck. It's like, what kind of freedom is that when the vast majority of uh, the time you have is decided by your boss, like what you're going to be doing? That's freedom for the mega wealthy and zero freedom for the proletariat and essentially you're born into these positions right you know wealth is the majority of it's inherited there's basically there's almost zero wealthy people who have like actually pulled themselves up from nothing like it happens but um a lot of the uh generational poverty and then generational wealth is a thing um so it's like what kind of freedom is that there's no economic mobility you're stuck doing whatever your boss says and whereas in the soviet union maybe you have less freedom to criticize the party but you have a stronger union everybody's paid well 100 percent education rates 100 percent unemployment i mean 100 percent employment zero percent homelessness um you way stronger you union rights. Fired. you can't get fired for unduly um, way more vacation time, uh, three weeks on average, 21 days on average for the Soviet system. So it's like, what system gives you more freedom? Like, uh, obviously there's less freedom in some ways under the Soviet system, but there's more freedom overall for the working class, which is the vast majority of our citizens. Um, so, I mean, Marx was huge on freedom and liberty of the individual, but under capitalism, freedom and liberty of the individual basically gets stamped out. Yeah, each each time a new epoch comes about, um, they're what they have to do is get the concepts that represent that specific interest and universalize it. So that's what we see in the epoch of capitalism, where freedom is not what any sane human being would conceive of as freedom, as not having to work twelve hours a fucking day um, in order to not starve. But freedom now becomes the freedom of the bourgeois class to oppress the rest of society and that's really troubling and then we have people who who continue like like we were talking about continue to think they're free while they're you know in chains um yeah there was a point that you make that um 
that I was going to answer to, but I kind of forgot what the fuck I was going to say. What else are you going to say? Oh, yeah, I, I did want to say one more thing, too. Is people are so worried about government control because they're like, you know, kind of that libertarian idea. The less government control equals maximum freedom. And that doesn't make any sense because under, like, zero government control, you have, like, child slavery and then you have like or not slavery but you have child labor no nothing to implement safety conditions in the workforce and like you were saying earlier we already have the government infringing on our lives the only thing is the government's been completely bought by the class so we have things like the nsa who can spy on every single thing we we're doing and saying and they are and then you have the CIA who will go into any Latin American country and overthrow their democratically elected leaders at the behest of corporations so they can have access to those resources. You have the military who's all have military bases in 70% of other countries um, are doing a shadow war in Africa and are draining the Middle East of all their resources. And then people are like, oh, we want less government control. It's like, what do you mean? The government's already huge, but it's an apparatus that's controlled by the by one class, by the owning class, by a small amount of extremely wealthy people. What we need to do is, as workers, take control of the apparatus that is the state and use it for our own class interests. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand because they're like, we want less government intervention. It's like, what do you mean? The government's intervening no matter what. It's just whether you allow it to be controlled by the owning class of society or you allow it to be controlled by the workers, the bourgeoisie or the proletariat. And right now it's 100% controlled by the owning class. And that's how you see it used. And just overall, the fact that people accept the, the concept of like individual freedom in a way that's separate from collective freedom and collective participation is just absurd in itself. Um, there is no sort of individual freedom without uh, being enmeshed within the collective interest. We're, we're social animals. Um, we're also laborious animals. The reason why we survive is because we can work and work in different ways and produce different things. But in order to do that, we do it together with other animals. Um, we're dependent on other people in order to survive. You can't just, you know, pop a baby out and then leave it in the woods and survive. So everything we have is, is, comes from a system of relations, of labor between people and of ideas um, that is impossible to separate any sort of individual activity from the whole systems of relations that comes behind it. It's a real fetishized view to think that freedom is something that happens in the level of the individual, completely disconnected from the collective. Um, Marx has a good quote in the German ideology where he says that um, that individual freedom only really comes when there's like a collective emancipation and collective freedom, and that's that's definitely the case. Like I, I don't feel like I, I'm free to make choices that are already predetermined by the system. So. I guess you're 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 in you're in the plantation and you're free to decide whether you want to pick cotton or pick something else but you're still in a plantation you're still a slave just because you have freedom of choice on what you want to devote your next you know couple of days or whatever to doesn't mean you're actually free you're still within the paradigm of of an oppressive exploitative dominating enslaving system Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a little off topic, but one of the arguments I've been hearing against Marx is that Marx wasn't even an economist. And that's so ridiculous. It's just the fact that regular economists don't analyze the social relations that come about within the economy. They, are, they look at productivity. They look at how well firms are doing. Um, they look at unemployment, but they don't look at the social re relations that arise um, within the capitalist mode of production. And that's so key. That's why Marx studied a million different things. He was an economist, an accountant, a sociologist, a psychologist, because he wanted to study what happens to the human psychology under this system. And uh, basically, uh, we have a system that tells you to create as much profit as you can for yourself, you know, to acquire as much capital as you can. 
and it's an individualist philosophy and it one it's one that tells you to just you know pull yourself up by your bootstraps you got this you can do it yourself anything could be accomplished with hard work and like you know there's nothing against hard work but like you said we are social animals we're supposed to work collectively um for the good of the whole you know or not supposed to but it it's in our nature to do so and this current system forces you to fetishize commodities and look to grow your own material wealth so you can acquire more and more and more commodities until one day you die with your and hopefully you've acquired enough commodities to be happy under the system um and it's not a system that, that uh encourages collaboration that uh, encourages being social that encourages working together and community with one another and uh that's all that marx was talking about was uh changing this system evolving it into one that you know does encourage those things um and yeah i don't know he wrote it in the 1800s and basically everything he said about capitalism has come true he said crises were inherent to capitalism he talked about commodity fetishization he talked about uh there being a metabolic rift between nature and the capitalist system and obviously all these things have come true the further we get into this capitalist system and people don't understand capitalism came about in the 16 or 1700s right and humans are 10,000 years old and we've had this one system for 300 400 years and people think it can't be changed like no nope, this is the end all be all this is the end of history it's like you guys are crazy before capitalism we had feudalism and slavery and then now we've evolved to this which has created what we have but it's time to move on to something else um yeah there was know. there was in the in the in the 19th century a american anthropologist lewis henry morgan who scientifically through anthropology and not just like the type of science that marx did um just basically proved that these conceptions that um it, about the way the state works about constant war um the conception that things are uh basically the capitalist system that the way that since since capitalism and and like any other system likes to universalize the principles that are for its interests people believe that these things have existed forever yeah there's always been state there's always been um you know the rule of few and and one of the things he demonstrates is that no like there's been collective participation throughout most of human history it is only very recent that we have such a individualized um individual based system um and and the reality is that yeah the system has been able to uh, develop humanity more than any other system it's been great at um at producing shit um but at what expense right so it's been at, at at the expense of humans and those of us who live in the center of the empire were where capital grows because capital accumulates where where capital grows yet we we yeah we live a little better we have our laptops and and stuff like that but um just imagine if that development would have happened under a system that would have based their principles on just making human life better and not profit and then maybe as a consequence making human life better right so what we see is that yeah the people that live in the empire live better so it's hard to analyze things like like Steven Pinker was talking about all the time how things are so much better thanks to capitalism but globally there's still like 29,000 kids that die a day from preventable diseases and then there's how many fucking billionaires in the US alone right that can any one of them can cure all of that just in in the blink of an eye so it's people love to think that there's um there's poor people or there's injustices and there's millionaires and billionaires right they don't think that there's poor people because there's billionaires and and millionaires right and it's like terry eagleton talks about it in in the first chapter of why marx was right which is um people it, it, like republicans or conservatives overall love to talk about how yeah well that's just the way things are right and and the thing is that well yeah there's detectives there's detectives and there's criminals but there's detectives because there are criminals right there's 
poor people because there are extremely wealthy people, right? And people think a lot of the times like we hate billionaires, but it's like they're just as much of a product of the system as the working class because what does this system incentivize? What does every single fossil fuel executive have to do? They have to keep growing their company and they have to keep um, making a profit. They have to expand and they have to make more and more capital at, you know, and there's no motivation from the system itself to uh, help your workers out or to maybe stop expanding your fossil fuel company so that the earth doesn't get destroyed. There's no motivation by that. You can look at, I mean, just look at like NASA. Think of instead of a few fossil fuel billionaires like the Koch brothers having all this wealth and power and having nothing but a motivation to expand. Think if we had um, our energy was controlled by something like NASA where it's owned by the people and our tax dollars pay for it. And they're as an organization, all they do is research and study and find new stuff. And out of that tons of innovation has come about, which has helped us learn more about the universe we live in and advance and do things that are good for the whole of humanity because that's what their goal as an organization is. They're not owned by somebody who's trying to increase their own personal capital. Um, so that, right, I mean, just between those two institutions, you got private institutions and all they're trying to do is make as much money for their stockholders as they can. And there's no incentive to protect the planet. There's no incentive to do anything for workers. And then on the other hand, you got publicly owned institutions whose only incentive is to do things to help the planet, further uh, humanity's understanding of the universe, to create new technology that helps people. And if we were able to socialize and democratize the entire economy, we could have all the um, all the amazing technology and all the really smart people we have now working towards the good of humanity rather than working towards creating more profit for a very small number of people but you're forgetting eddie the government is inefficient anything the government does can be done way better by the free market <laughs> i forgot Which i think i've always found that to be a funny point when like in other countries, the government does things way better than our, our private markets do, like healthcare, for example. It's like, no, when the American government does stuff, it's really shitty because we're so inefficient. But plenty of other countries have found ways for their government to run things very well. I think a great like, podcast episode where we just get like quite a few questions that are like, the common objections to socialism, and we go like over it, or even if we ask people who are not in in our like sort of idea space to ask like their objections um and and go through them that'd be that's essentially what um terry eagleton does in the book why marx is right he gets 10 common objections and he just completely destroys it so if anyone's listening who just um uh, is still skeptical about like marxism and, and socialism i highly recommend that book it goes through like the 10 most common and basic objections to Marxism and just completely destroys it. So. Yeah. What were you going to say, Eddie? Uh, yeah, I was going to say how that uh, we have examples in the United States of the public sector working better than the private sector. Like our buddy worked at NASA this summer and he talked about SpaceX, like Elon Musk's company. They call it Slavex in Florida because they're essentially you work there 90 hours a week for two years and then you quit and then you can put it on your resume and then you can work anywhere you want for the rest of your life but what is spacex focusing on compared to what nasa is focusing on nasa is focusing on expanding our knowledge of the universe creating new technology which buddy has told me they're forced to hand over to spacex because like I said, all these government, all our public institutions are essentially owned by the bourgeois class at this point. So NASA's forced to give a lot of their research over to SpaceX. And then what kind of shit do you see coming out of SpaceX? It's like the Cybertruck and like they want to do, uh, take like tourists to space and stuff. It's like, how is this helping humanity? It's not, it's helping to stuff Elon Musk's pockets. But that's the... That's the motivation between public and private. Private, the motivation is profit for a small amount of people and publicly owned things. The motivation is learning more and advancing humankind. So like 
like Brock said, there are examples of like the NHS and socialized healthcare doing much better in other countries. But even here in the U.S., you can see it. Or like, do you want privately owned roads? Like, does that sound fun to anyone or a privately owned fire department where like you call up the fire department when your house is on fire and like, oh, let me see. You're not on our plan, sir. We can't come put out your fire. Oh, you forgot to pay your fire department private premium this month. So uh, your house is going to burn down. Like, no, some things you want public. <laughs> like, honestly, the whole economy you want public. But, um, public just works better in some ways. Or considering choice like yeah, when I'm filling out my fire department insurance, if it's the living room that's on fire, yes, you can come in. If it's the bathroom, don't come in. Like, <laughs> what the fuck type of choice is that? <laughs> and it's, but, yeah, I don't know. it's ridiculous. Especially the argument against socializing healthcare will never make any sense to me. And, <laughs> Yeah, there's the two, um, like, there's two levels. There's the level of, like, nationalizing the essential things, which I think most people are absolutely, most people that actually think about it in an honest way will agree that, you know, it's, it's, it definitely has to be done. Like, other capitalist countries around the world even have it like this, where they have the essential things nationalized. Um but it's about also making the argument that, well, everything else should be as well. Everything else should be aimed at the goal of improving the, uh, like, human life and not just making profit. Like, there's so much money that goes into the example that Dr. Dar uses that goes into, like, balding, right? Like, that money could be going to something else that's more essential that can provide more uh, uh, benefits. And there's fucking idiots like Peter Singer who talks about fucking like uh, altruistic ethics that that is basically, oh, if you're going to spend your $5 on a sandwich, just, just buy a $3 sandwich and, t and send like $2 to Africa for malaria. No, you fucking idiot. Like, it's the system that creates those conditions. Like, if you're going to see like an altruistic ethic individualized, you're never going to fix the problem. And that's the same problem with charity. Like charity is very perverse, in my opinion, because it seeks for individual solutions that you very well know are not going to cure the problem itself, the source of the problem. But you want to continue doing it because it makes you feel good when you do it. Right? Like instead of promoting altruism as an individual thing, let's promote an altruistic system, a system that's based on caring for people and not fucking making more money. Mm -hmm. And under our system, charity becomes like a scam. Like you got the Koch brothers basically creating a giant network of right-wing education and right-wing think tanks, and they're donating millions and millions of dollars to these, and then they're writing it off as charitable donations, so it's tax-free. And then they can be like, oh, look how good of people we are. We gave this much money to charity. And it's like, no, until you change the system, uh, charity's just putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. First of all. Second of all, that's not charity. That's just you brainwashing more people to help you accumulate more wealth, which is what everything becomes under this system is just a ploy to gain more wealth. I mean, think about it. Everyone's always trying to monetize their hobbies, right? If you play guitar, it's like, oh, how can I make money off this? How can I use this to enhance my wealth? It's like, why not just play guitar for the joy of playing music? But under this system, everything becomes fetishized, and you just want to um, use everything to increase your own personal capital. Kind that of comes from uh, Marx's, Marx's labor theory of value. Like, what the system does is completely prioritize exchange value over use value so the the goodness of a of a book is not in quality but it's in how much it's sold oh shit brock's backwards <laughs> uh, uh, there we go. you can see that in hollywood too with the like directors and writers are constantly complaining that the studios are always messing with their with their scripts and their movies trying to change it to put more butts in the seats and it's like 
why is that part of the creative process at all? You know, we should have writers and artists with a vision creating their art for people to see, but instead we have these studios, the boss, the boot, you know, the representation of the bourgeois class in this situation, taking the, the labor of the writers, of the directors, of the actors and saying, no, this is how we want it in order to make more money. It might make the overall story worse. It might change your vision of what this art should be, but we want it changed in order to increase our capital. And that's a perfect microcosm of the whole system because you have the studio who's doing no actual labor. They're just providing the money and the resources which the directors and the writers need to make their films. But then they're coming in and altering the creative process with the only goal of creating more money rather than telling a better story, which would be better for um, the people going to watch the movie. Um, and it's like, why don't we just have the writers and the directors and the actors and the people who are um, actually doing the labor control the whole system so that they can have in full control over their uh, over their art? Why can't they own the means of production collectively? And that's what we're saying basically at a whole level is everyone's labor becomes perverted and it, they become alienated from it and it's just used by whoever your boss is to create more profit for them to maximize their profit and uh yeah that's what we're talking about changing the beauty of yeah, like it's not necessarily that profit is inherently evil but when it's the main focus it is it's just not going to be the most efficient thing like in healthcare you're not looking to save as many people you're actually willing the goal is to help as little people as possible because that's making the most profit that's what's going to happen when profits your main motive the, the beauty of like the situation that, that we're in is that we don't have to even create new concepts um, when we're like just tactically talking to people because like the concept of freedom that we already talked about, it's just a matter of changing their mentality from what the system considers to be free to what is actually free, uh, to what freedom actually is or democracy. Um, and show them how their interest lies in in a real sort of freedom or a real sort of democracy, having an actual say at work or having um, the the freedom to decide more things in your life, not just what you can buy. Um, having the freedom not to worry about fucking getting sick and having to pay the bill or the same thing with rent or food. Um, so the, the, the kind of the beauty of the capitalist system is that it gives us already a sense of um, idealized ideas that we can latch onto for our project. And that's not something that happened when we were transitioning from like feudalism to capitalism, because like some of the values that were in feudalism are completely the antithesis of capitalism. But in the, the paradox is that like in practice, like the capitalist acts in a way similar to the values of feudalism while promoting the values that are really more in line with a post-capitalist society. And as far as profit goes, um, I think that we, like the conception that we have of profit, we, we still have to go back and examine like what profit is according to Marx and profit cannot be created unless there is exploitation. So, like, I would say that there is no good thing as, as there's no such thing as good profit. Um, there's always someone getting screwed over. The thing is that we conceive of every time we make money from something as that being profit. But that's not necessarily what profit is, right? That's just natural exchanges. And those things existed before capitalism. What is considered profit specifically under capitalism is when you get the process of production, which takes into account the natural materials, the natural tools that are used and the laborer. And instead of just letting it keep going naturally and exchanging um, from, from commodity money, commodity CMC, and you switch the process so that now a capitalist owns the whole operation. And the goal of the operation is to go from money to commodity to money. So the expansion of capital, um, that's when it turns into profit as, as it is in capitalism. And that is inherently exploitative. There was, there was the, the, there was things done. There was capital before capitalism. Like there was finance capital in a sense, like where there was debt and there was interest and stuff like that. And the Romans had certain types of capital 
um, that Marx talks about it in the, the Gundries. But what the system does is that it focuses everything that's in society for the purpose of maximizing capital. And that cannot happen without the person who is actively adding value, which is the person who's doing the work. That profit does not exist without a portion of that person's work being taken away from him and going into the hands of the person that owns the whole system. And while this is happening in a factory, this is happening in another factory, and it's happening in the whole of society overall. So like a good concept that, you know, that we can latch on to that Republicans love to talk about is theft, right? <laughs> Taxation is theft. But what they don't realize is that every day when they wake up and get their fucking, their little uh, uh, lunchbox and go to work, they're getting robbed for the majority of the time that they're at work because they're producing an immense amount of more wealth than, than what they're making. They're only getting paid enough to go back home, eat, and come back to work the next day, right? They're not getting paid the value of what they produce. And what our project is as socialists is just to live in a society where what you produce is what you deserve, right? If, and, and, and these are messages that will resonate with anyone. If you work X amount of hours and produce X amount of things, you deserve probably most of it, not just a very small percent enough for you to survive and come back the next day and do the same shit. So, yeah, like we, we need to be able to use the concepts that we kind of, uh, th that our society values in our project because I, uh, one of the problems that I, that I see that I think we, we talked about it um, I talked about it with Alex and Addison in the last Zoom, which was we keep looking at Eastern Europe, uh, at Russia, at China, um, or at Latin America for what socialism is. Or if not, then we look at socialism as an abstract concept. But one of the things we have to focus on is looking at socialism as it would be applied in our situation in America. And what are the values that Americans like, right? And from those values, decide what are we going to do with with this project how are we going to create socialism with american characteristics because americans are really alienated by the word in part because they conceive of it as something that is going to um, destroy their identity a lot of people think that communism is anti-american and what we have to really try to do is connect american values to our project and re and, and help people realize that when we speak of socialism we're not talking about transitioning into Russian culture or Cuban culture or Chinese culture. We want to continue American culture, but in a way that gives dignity to the work that Americans do, in a way that gives Americans the freedom that they don't have under the current system, in a way that the, the, the freedom which the owning class has, which restricts the freedom of everyone else, is limited and controlled, right? Um, so it's, it's a project that we don't do enough, but it's one that is absolutely necessary, which is connecting American values to our project of socialism. That's, that's a really good point. I think, especially as far as on the, on the right side, that's one of the biggest turnoffs of from where we're coming from is like, they don't want to be like China. They don't want to be like another culture. Like American culture is so different and unique that like all of those are scary. So how, how then do we take these things and make them, make them more American, make something that's more appealing to the working class of America? I think there's a lot of things you can do. Like, first of all, like they always, you know, Republicans, they like the right to life, right? That's what they always talk about. And it's like, you don't have a right to life. Like you guys want right to life when you're in the womb, but then as soon as you're out of the womb, you're screwed, you know, 60,000 people die every year because they don't have health care. However many troops die. If you look globally, uh, we have 1.9 million people who die of starvation every year as we throw away 70% of our produce in the U S it's like, this is not a system that pro, uh, protects human life. So you can argue from that standpoint, like if you want to protect human life, if you care about that value, then you need to support a single payer healthcare system. You need to support deliberalizing 
food production so that we can provide food to everybody. We need to nationalize housing so that we can provide housing to everybody. And rent can be 2% or 3% of your income rather than 30% of the average worker's income, which it is right now. Um, and then other things too, where I think the liberals are messing up is like guns. Um, they constant, like, of course, Republicans are like, it's not a gun issue, it's a health care, it's a mental health issue. And then they don't promote anything to help with mental health. But we need to be serious. Like, no, yeah, there's a lot of mental health problems, but we want to provide mental health access to every single person. And we want to create a society that doesn't keep pumping out socially isolated teenagers who go and shoot up their school we want to change the way this works but we also don't want to take your guns away because that's a huge part of american culture and right there pretty much you lose probably 30 to 40 percent of the country when you say hey we're going to take your guns away and you know we can have some kind of common sense regulation we can have it be like getting a driver's license but you're not going to argue like for these huge gun bans or you're, you're going to automatically turn off all the country even when you have these points to argue like, hey, don't you want more control over your workplace? Don't you think you should be making more money? Don't you think your rent's too high? Don't you think your insurance costs are too high? But you're not going to get them on those issues because they turn you off as soon as you say, oh, also, we want to take your assault rifles away. So I yeah. think recognizing the kind of culture we have and trying to argue for those things. Family values is another one. Like, how do we how do we promote the poor family right now when 70% of people live paycheck to paycheck? That's not being able to support your family. You know, if we want strong families, we need to pay people what they're worth and we need to create, uh, we need to make it so people can take their kids to get health care if they're sick without going bankrupt. We need to make it so people can send their kids to college without taking on $80,000 in debt. Um, and we can argue that from the standpoint of don't you care about family values? Uh, these things that are important to American culture that liberals have kind of completely written off. And not just yeah, culturally, I, it's in the Constitution. Like, minimum wage is supposed to be adjusted to however much it takes a family to survive. And we're a country that was created, at least in the level of ideological justification, on, on Christian values, right? And, and these are things that are, are in rerum navarum. Um, these are the things that represent the ethic of, of Jesus and, and, and the sort of life style that he promoted. So it's, I think, already within the culture, we have more than enough to work with to promote our cause. I think uh, people really mis misunderstand what we're saying with socialism, too. Like, anytime you talk to a working class type person, he's telling you, like, oh, I don't want my money to go support some dude who's laying on his ass. But it's like, no, you got it all wrong. Right now, your money is going to support someone who's laying on his ass. What we're doing is we want the system to work for you. We want you to have more money. We want you to not spend 20% of your, of your income on health care. Like, it's just, there's just such a wrong view of what we're actually trying to do. You know, it's not about helping people who aren't working. It's about helping the people who are working. I saw a people just promoted as a, as a pyramid scheme, and we're like, uh, do you want to make 300 times your paycheck? That's <laughs> the revolutionary cause. <laughs> I saw a comic today. It was like a libertarian, and the government comes up to him, and he's like, hey, I need your taxes. And the libertarian's like, no, taxation is theft. And then the landlord comes up, and he's like, hey, I need 30% of your income. And the libertarian's like, here you go. It's exactly what you said. It's like, you're – there's not that many people who are sitting around sucking on welfare, like getting rich from welfare and not working at all. You know, everybody works. It's just the fact that the system is designed to take all your money. The average worker spends 20% of their money on insurance and then 30% on rent. And it's like, well, what else do you have after that? If 50% of your paycheck is going to people who, like you said, are sitting on their ass, aren't doing anything. Like I'm sure there are good landlords, but my landlord owns like 50, 50 houses here and he's collecting 300 or i don't know however much money he's got to be a multi-millionaire from like he doesn't have to do much he just calls people up and hires them to come over and fix our stuff when it's broken which is nice but why is that something we have at all why do we not collectively own housing and have everybody pay like the ussr they paid two or three percent of their income towards rent um, like you said, those are the real people who are stealing from you. Like the government is at some level because they're taking your money and funneling it into the U.S. empire, the war machine and uh, and other stuff, you know, corporate subsidies and whatnot. But really the people stealing your money are landlords and private insurance companies. And like Carlos was saying, your boss who's taking 
all the money that you make from your labor. Throw, so you take a piece of wood, you turn it into a chair, he sells the chair for 10 bucks, keeps nine and gives you $1. You know, that's the real theft. Absolutely. Yeah. So somehow changing just the whole thought, thought process around socialism, Marxism, whatever it is to not, not being about helping lazy people, about helping yourself and about hard work, you know, like that, that's what this is really about. The people working hard, getting what they deserve. Well, yeah, Lennon would say that if you don't fucking work, you don't eat. Like, if you have the capacities to work and you don't work, you don't eat. Like, we're the antithesis of promoting uh, uh, just handouts, right? Who promotes handouts? Well, the system that hands out all the wealth to the person who just owns. So I, I think a good contextualized example is now with the, the checks that are going to be coming in, the 1200 bucks. Like, that's we, we, we talk about it like if that's helping people. But all that's really doing is subsidizing landlords because that's all going to the fucking landlord. Like 600 bucks out of that is going to my landlord. So what am I really getting? You know, I'm not, it's not like I'm getting fucking anything substantial. All that's doing is con if you do that without eliminating the necessity to pay rent, all you're doing is subsidizing the, the landlord. That's a really good point. I never even thought about that. It's, it's like harder for us to see here in, in Dubuque where everything's so cheap. But in other places where the same apartment that I have here would have been 1200 bucks, what the fuck does a $1,200 check do for me? Right. You know? For sure. All right, I got to take a dump. So you guys want to call it? <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah, it fuck up. it. All right. Thanks for talking, boys. Hey, we should um, we should do this again for the when we do the Len McCluskey book club. Yeah, record that shit too and throw it up because uh, one of one.